Uh, early dietary habits uh, may set a lifelong pattern that leads to problems in later life. This is one of the reasons why you need to control what your little guys are eating. Um, if they eat potato chips, uh, they will turn into uh, chubby little fellas like this. Uh, this is not healthy. It's not healthy. He's got too much body fat. As you can see, it's all over his, he's got fat all over his body, doesn't get enough exercise, uh, watches television, drinks soda, eats potato chips uh, primarily for, for lunch. I have a, um, a niece, I have two nieces actually, my, my uh, sister's kids. Um, she had four, four girls and, were there four? Yeah, four girls. And the last two uh, only ate cheese pizza, french fries, they drank soda, uh, usually Coke. What else did they eat? They, for breakfast they would eat uh, link sausage. That breakfast sausage. Anyway, so and that's it. That's all they ever ate. So for breakfast they ate the sausage. Uh, the only thing that they would eat would be cheese pizza and french fries and then they would drink soda. They would, didn't drink any milk. Uh, one of them is, has all these interesting autoimmune diseases now, uh, which is kind of curious. She's got, one, she's got a liver disease, she's also got arthritis. Uh, a lot of, she's in a lot of trouble. She's only in her 30s and this kid can barely move around at all. And she ate crap uh, for the first 15 or, or 20 years of her life. And then she started smoking meth. So now she's, she's paying for it. She's going to die young. She'll pro probably die before I do. Because <laughs> I'm going to live forever. <laughs> and she ain't. That's, that's for sure. Diet has been implicated in five of the leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, atherosclerosis. Uh, so eating these fatty foods is probably not the best idea for you. Uh, the strange thing was if those girls drank, there were two of them, and they were the two babies of the family, if they drank milk, they'd vomit. They'd throw it up. they projectile vomit it. Uh, so they couldn't eat any dairy products, except for their, the only dairy they got was in the cheese pizza, as bizarre as that is. If there was pepperoni or black olives or uh, uh, onions on the pizza, they would throw up, as weird as that is. So that was their defense mechanism. <clears throat> so what it looks like to starve to death. Uh, 40 to 45 percent of the total calories in average Western diet are consumed through dietary fat. Uh, humans naturally crave fat because of their ancestral feast and famine cycle. And of course that's the reason why we eat so much fatty foods. Uh, we crave it. Uh, it is necessary. We need it to consume as much pr uh, fat as possible. We saw this again in the 1930s uh, during the, the Great Depression. Uh, there are a lot there 25 percent of the population were out of work. Uh, the people that were still working uh, they had reduced their wages by as much as 35 percent. So they weren't making as much money as they were before. People were needed to uh, be very uh, selective as to what they ate, so they would buy as fatty a food as possible. This is when bacon became very popular. Uh, this is when uh, hamburgers became very popular. Uh, why are hamburgers popular? Because they've got a lot of fat in them. Uh, so you could fry yourself up a hamburger, you could take the grease and make gravy out of it. So everybody was eating gravy with all their meals. Uh, they were consuming as much fat as possible. Both of my parents went through the Great Depression. My mom was born in 1915, my dad was born in 1918, and both of them grew up during the Depression. And because of that, they ate some really weird foods. <clears throat> they ate a lot, a lot of bacon. And as I have said before, the bacon back then didn't have very much meat in it. It was not lean bacon. It was pretty fatty. They would cook all their food in bacon grease. That's to, get, that's to consume as much fat as possible. They ate a lot of gravy. My dad would eat uh, gravy on, on bread, on just 
bread that wasn't toasted, uh, wasn't biscuits, it was bread. And the reason he did that was because when they had stale bread, or day-old bread, or two-day-old bread, or, or month-old bread, when the bread was old and, and uh, fairly hard and lost most of its moisture, they put gravy on it so they could consume it. They needed to take in all of the, the calories that they possibly could. <clears throat> and this is what happens during famine. People will consume as much fatty foods as they possibly can. Uh, the um, Assiniboine, the, uh, the uh, Nakoda-speaking people uh, that lived in, bu in Buffalo country, what they would do, uh, they would not only butcher the beef and make jerky out of it, or not beef, what am I talking about, the buffalo, but then they would take the bones, they'd crack them open, and they would boil them and get all the, gre the grease out of the bones, all the fat out of the bones. And that's one of the reasons why they were called the Assiniboine. Assiniboine means... Uh, people that cook with hot rocks. So what they would do, they'd dig a pit, and they would line it with a buffalo hide. Uh, they would boil, they would put water in it, and they would put hot rocks in there to boil the bones. they put the bo bones in the, in the pit with the, with the hot water, and they'd throw the hot rocks in there, and then they'd boil the fat out of the, out of the bones to get the fat. And then they would take the fat, and they'd mix it with berries. I can't remember what they call it. It's got a name. Pemmican, that's what they call it, pemmican. Anyway, which tastes like shit. <laughs> it really tastes bad. <laughs> I mean, it's got berries in it, but it's also got all this animal fat. <laughs> and it kind of gets rancid after a while, but it, you're, it's better to eat rancid food than not eat anything at all. Uh, our ancestors were far more active than we are today, but we haven't changed our eating patterns to fit our sedentary lifestyle. And this is a problem. The people that uh, grew up in the, during the Depression, uh, those individuals still cooked as if they were, still, they were in the Depression. My mother always cooked with bacon grease, uh, despite the fact she was a nurse and she knew that this probably wasn't that good for you. Of course, we had just come out of the Great Depression when people were consuming a lot of fat. People were dying from heart disease in their 50s, but that's okay because they were also smokers. And so they were, they were damaging themselves with, with the tobacco and with the body fat, with the uh, animal fat that they were consuming. People cooked with lard. Lard is pig fat. So all, there was always a, an animal fat in their, in their uh, food. Uh, then, they de then, then they developed Crisco. Crisco was like 30% vegetable fat, and it was supposed to be healthier, and it was, it was clear, too. Uh, of course, bacon grease is not clear, it's okay, relatively okay. Lard, of course, is yellow, if you've ever seen lard, uh, but Crisco was clear. It was actually white, but it turned clear when you cooked with it. So people started cooking with, with Crisco. My mother started cooking with Crisco. But she would still flavor her green beans, this is the vegetable that we were eating for supper, with, with bacon grease. And when she made uh, collard greens or when she made uh, uh, any, any other turnip greens, she always cooked with, with bacon grease. Because she grew up during the Depression, and that's how she learned to cook. It's funny, like all these cooking shows, they actually show that like, they cook like the bacon first, and then once they take out the bacon, and then they put like the vegetables are cooked up with the bacon fat. Oh, is that right? Yeah, these cooking shows these days. So I was just like, that's not normal. <laughs> no, it's not. You're, you're getting animal fat where you should just yeah. Be yeah. Rough it. yeah. <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. That's not normal. Sorry, uh, but it does taste better. It's yeah, that's why the, that's why they cooked it in there because it fuses the flavor of. The bacon into the nice right. thing. Uh, what what do I do? What was I what was I doing? I see. I'm I'm not a I'm not a, always a, a, a wise man. Uh, I was making uh, fried potatoes, uh, cooking you know five strips of bacon, and then I, I was cooking my potatoes in, in the uh, bacon grease. Now the problem is the bacon's so lean now. There's hardly any fat in it. There's no grease to cook in anyway. But I'm still cooking it. Just like my mother taught me, I, I'm uh, cooking in animal fat. Uh, there are four main types of dietary fats. There are trans fats, uh, which are created when hydrogen is added to vegetable oil to give it longer shelf life and better texture and a better taste. 
But this stuff is toxic, uh, so trans fats. So if you look on a package and it says there are trans fats in there, don't buy it. It's not good. Jerky. <laughs> trans fats. Whoops, where did that come from? Uh, saturated fats are found in foods made from animals, meat, milk, and eggs. Saturated fats. Saturated fats aren't especially good for you either. But there are fats that are good for you. Mon uh, monosaturated Mono unsaturated fats are found in vegetable oils like olive oil and canola oil and peanut oil. And for this reason, uh, if you buy margarine that's made out of uh, mono unsaturated fats, canola oil or olive oil, uh, then it's probably not bad for you. We're okay now. We're not consuming uh, bad fats. Uh, the polyunsaturated fats, uh, there's two types of polyunsaturated fats. There's omega-6 fatty acids and there's omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-6 fatty acids come from corn, soybean, sesame oil, and safflower oils. Uh, the uh, omega-3 fatty acids come from cold water fish like salmon and also from flaxseed. Uh, if you go to, to health food stores, uh, you can buy flaxseed, you can buy safflower oil, uh, you can buy soybean uh, oil. Uh, th these are all good fats. These are all fats that will uh, not hurt you, uh, like uh, uh, saturated fats and trans fats. Not all fats are bad. Uh, trans fats are unhealthy and should be avoided, of course. Uh, and that's what they're talking about. Uh, if you read a package of, uh, if you read the back of your uh, potato chips, uh, Lay's no longer uses trans fats, and they brag about it, usually on the front of their, of their package. No, zero trans fats. Uh, in the old days, of course, they used to put it in there, and it made it taste the potato chips taste really, really good. Uh, not so much anymore. The, the flavor of potato chips not the same as it used to be. And that's mainly because there's no trans fats in the, uh, uh, in the potato chips. Saturated fats aren't as dangerous as trans fats, but should be consumed in moderation. Uh, if you, uh, eat, if you uh, eat, uh, I'm talking about potato chips here, like everybody eats them. Uh, if you eat the uh, kettle potato chips, usually they're cooked in, in saturated fats. And for that reason, they're not, not nearly as healthy as, uh, as the ones with, without uh, the trans fats or the, the uh, saturated fats. Monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats are actually helpful and should be consumed uh, to give the consumer the feeling of satiety, uh, which can help prevent overeating, reduce cholesterol in the blood, and have an anti-inflammatory effect on the body. The body. So if you eat those omega-6 and omega-3 fats, then it's actually good for you. Cholesterol is a waxy substance that is responsible for strong cell walls, for myelination of uh, nerve cells, and production of hormones. We need cholesterol. You need some cholesterol in your system. But the reality is your liver produces all the cholesterol that you need. So you don't have to consume it. But it's okay if you do consume it, as long as it's the good stuff and not the bad stuff. As long as it's not saturated fats or trans fats. Cholesterol from our diet is non-essential, of course, because the liver manufactures all the cholesterol that you need. Animal fats that we eat circulate in the blood as serum cholesterol. Uh, so usually that has to do with, your, with the amount of uh, animal fats that you're consuming. My wife has become a flexitarian. She doesn't eat meat very often, and when she does eat meat, she eats small portions. So she's decided that she's going to fix herself by doing this. It's her way of not having to exercise. She hates to ex exercise. So she keeps going on the, all these interesting diets uh, to try to uh, reduce her weight and to uh, make herself healthy. It's not working. If you don't exercise, it ain't going to work. I keep telling her that. Doesn't believe. Obviously, I'm a big liar. I don't know how any of you guys can even sit in my class since I, I can't tell my wife a damn thing. Mm -hmm. I told her for years that she had sleep apnea and she wouldn't believe me. My daughter slept uh, in the same room with her once, told her that she was not breathing sometimes when she was asleep. And my wife, tomorrow, my wife goes in for a sleep, <laughs> slept last week. My daughter tells her one time that she has sleep apnea, and, and I've been telling her for years. Anyway, uh, 
I must be the dumbest person in the whole wide world. I apologize for being so stupid. <laughs> uh, evidently, my daughter has this ability to, to convince people that just one, t telling them one time uh, to get them to change their behavior. Animal fats that we eat circulate in the blood, of course, is serum cholesterol. And, of course, we want as little cholesterol in our system as possible. Serum cholesterol is made up of proteins uh, called lipoproteins. Uh, there are three types of lipoproteins. There's low-density lipoproteins. Uh, this is the, uh, the um, uh, cholesterol that carries, the, the, uh, that uh, circulates through our bodies. Unfortunately, it's the LDL that accumulates and causes problems. Uh, triglycerides are, are in the form of animal fat that's carried around the body, the triglycerides. And then there's high density lipoproteins which pick up LDLs and carry them out of your body in your stool. So if you have loose stool, maybe because you ate uh, a lot of fat, your HDL is cleaning out your body and that's one of the reasons why your stool is as loose as it, as it potentially is. How about that? Okay, so we've got three different uh, lipoproteins in our bodies. We have uh, low density uh, level uh, lipoproteins, we have triglycerides and high density level uh, lipoproteins. The HDL is the good stuff, the LDL is the bad stuff. So whenever you get your cholesterol taken, uh, you need to look at two, two different, th well you need to look at all three of them. Uh, but the two that are really important, the, if the LDL is high, you got a problem. If the triglyceride is high, it means you're eating too much too many hamburgers, you're eating too, many, too fatty of foods. Uh, of course, you can buy food that's, uh, I mean, you can buy hamburger that's like 96% lean. Don't make hamburgers out of it because it won't stick together. But uh, you can do that. Or you can buy the 70% stuff. What does that mean? That means that 30% of that hamburger is the fat stuff. Now, if you go and buy a hamburger at Laguna Burger, I can assure you, no, no offense to the, those, those Laguna guys, but I can assure you that the reason that hamburger sticks together so well is because of the fat. If you go to Blake's, I can, I can assure you that it ain't 96% lean. No way in hell. Uh, buffalo meat is so lean, has anybody ever had a buffalo burger? It's so lean that they have to put uh, 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 beef fat in it to make it stick together. It's just the way it works. So if you've ever had a buffalo burger, and it, it does taste a little bit different than beef. It's a darker red, if you've ever looked at it. <clears throat> Don't look at it, it's ugly. Anyway, okay, so we've got the three different uh, cholesterols. During your adolescent years, uh, puberty, when you're going through puberty, the body is awash with hormones. You need all those hormones, whether you're a male or a female. Uh, males need to become males, and the way they do that is through the testosterone. They need their testosterone. You need your cholesterol. You need your LDL at that point. You need that cholesterol to create all those hormones. If you're a female, you've got all this really interesting, you've got all these different hormones that you, you need to create so that you'll go through your first menses, so that you can reproduce in the future. All this is extremely important, and all this will take place in your teenage years, and this is one of the reasons why you're so nutty uh, in your teenage years, why you're so crazy. I think I told you that uh, when I was going through puberty, I didn't sleep. I stayed, and there's one summer, yeah, and I got up and I hit rocks with a broom hand. That's all I did, like three o'clock in the morning. Of course, it's all, the sun's almost up, I hit rocks with a broom hand. As stupid as that sounds. I'm having all these wild thoughts. I'm, oh my God, I'm insane. I wasn't insane. I was just going through puberty. All right. <laughs> cholesterol is a precursor to hormones, so looking uh, at uh, cholesterol until adulthood is contraindicated. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, kids never die of heart disease at uh, 18 or, or 21 or whatever. You're not going to die from heart disease until you're in your 30s. Uh, people start having heart attacks in their 30s. In the adulthood, uh, nutritionists uh, suggest that individuals maintain select levels of lipids. 
Uh, you need to, ha to have a total cholesterol of less than 200 milligrams per cent, milligrams per deciliter. Uh, where in the world did all this come from? Uh, this came from the Air Force. The Air Force, uh, you know, you got all these infantry guys. Who cares if one of them keels over dead? Somebody's going to shoot them anyway. That's okay. Nobody cared. But when you're, th when you're throwing these pilots up in the air, they're, they're flying these million-dollar airplanes. You don't want that guy dying while he's flying the airplane. Well, that's what was happening in the 50s. All these guys who had lived through the Depression uh, were getting up there. They were pulling all those Gs in the new airplanes, the new jets. Uh, before that, they were propeller-driven. They weren't that fast. They weren't pulling very many Gs. All of a sudden, in the new jet airplanes, they're going so fast that they're pulling just lots and lots of Gs. And because of that, they were, they were falling out of the sky. We had all these pilots that were dying from heart disease. We didn't, we, and we weren't exactly sure what was going on. They did autopsies, they looked at their blood vessels, and they found them all clogged with cholesterol. Why? Well, it's because they drank a lot, they smoked a lot, and they had uh, bacon and eggs for breakfast every morning. In the beginning, we thought, oh, my God, it must be the eggs. Look at all the cholesterol in eggs. But as it turns out, that's not, that's not that bad as cholesterol. It's not that bad. It's the bacon. It was the bacon fat that was the problem. But we didn't know that at the time. So we decided we needed to look at this. We could see all this atherosclerosis. They were, all their arteries were clogged. That's the reason they had a heart attack. We did the autopsies. We knew exactly what was going on. But we didn't know why. So they started a study, and they, they uh, did it at the Air Force Academy. It's one of the reasons why they started the Air Force Academy. Uh, so that they could track all of these uh, pilots. Uh, and we did. We, we tracked these pilots starting in the 1950s. Uh, we drew cholesterols on them to try, trying to determine what was going on. It was the Air Force that, that uh, came up with this, all, all of this stuff. We're the ones that uh, developed uh, the whole concept of fractionating uh, cholesterol. In the beginning, there was only one number. And if it was below 400, we thought the guy was okay. Then we lowered the norm to 300, and then we lowered the norm to what it is now, 200. They don't even like 200, the truth. The truth is they want it below 180, damn it. And this is one of the reasons why they got like everybody and their cousin on statins, trying to reduce their cholesterol. If you've had any indication, if you, got, if you have high blood pressure, they put you on statins. They don't just put you on blood pressure pills, they also put you on statins. And it's the Air Force that discovered all of this stuff. So we're the ones that, uh, the other fractionation that we were able to do, we were able to separate out the triglycerides from the cholesterol. We didn't know the LDL and the HDL thing yet. We didn't know there was a good cholesterol or that there was a bad cholesterol. But we had these guys that were flying around. Uh, well, we weren't letting them fly around. With these guys walking around with 300 cholesterols, but they weren't dying. And we had these other guys that had 200 cholesterols, and they were having heart attacks. But that didn't make any sense. So then we fractionated the cholesterol, and we realized that there was two different types, HDL and LDL. And the LDL was the bad stuff, and HDL was the good stuff. The more HDL you had, the um, uh, better off you were. So the guys with 300 might have had 150 milligrams of HDL. And for that reason, their ratio was so high that they were cleaning all this bad stuff out of their system. They could eat all the bacon that they wanted, and it didn't really make any difference. Anyway, that's where this, all this came from. I was in the service for 12 years, and every year we used to draw pilots in this program. And those pilots were the ones that, uh, that became the, the norms for, for all of these uh, cholesterol studies. And there you go. I know, we're watching them die. <laughs> no, it wasn't that funny. But every time one of these guys would have a heart attack, my God, they would, uh, they, they would uh, do autopsies on them uh, ad nauseum. I mean, they would keep these guys for like two weeks before they, they let them go. They had a, um, the Thunderbirds were the, the uh, flying team for the uh, Air Force. And uh, five of them were killed one time. They were, 
they were uh, they 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 they're up in Las Vegas, Nellis, up in uh, Las up north in Las Vegas, and these guys kept, they they all flew into the the uh, the ground. There were five of them. There were eight of them flying. Three of them were able to pull up. And five of them were killed. Geez, they didn't bury those guys for two weeks. I was working in a national cemetery in California, and three of them were from California, so they were burying them in California. We didn't get them for, three, for two weeks. I know, it's, it's huge. Oh, my God, just because of the Thunderbird. My God, the funerals. They had to close the whole rest of the, of the uh, cemetery that day so that they could bury those three guys. It was terrible. Hopefully not that, I guess. Anyway. <laughs> Interesting working in a cemetery. Uh oh. <clears throat> anyway, we won't talk about dead pilots anymore. We'll try not to anyway. Uh, some people maintain an unhealthy lifestyle. They smoke, uh, they're physically inactive, their diet is high in cholesterol and saturated fats. Uh, individuals with an unhealthy lifestyle have increased levels of LDLs and decreased levels of HDLs. As it turns out, the more you exercise, the higher your HDL level is, which is kind of exciting. You can improve your HDL level with, through exercise. And of course, this is a picture from Japan. <clears throat> Healthy individuals protected them, protect themselves from heart disease by elevating their HDL levels by eating certain polyunsaturated and monounsaturated uh, fats, by consuming vitamin E, uh, by eating low, uh, low in saturated fat diets, and high in fiber diets. And that's the way that you raise your HDL level. And that's what my wife's trying to do. She doesn't want to die of a heart attack. She wants to die of something else. She hasn't decided what she wants to die from yet. She's still, we're still waiting. 12% of women and 31% of men have low HDL. It's because they don't exercise enough. While cholesterol is partially, why would, why would there only be 12% of women? What's going on with women? Damn it, you've got estrogen, and that estrogen protects you until you go through menopause. After menopause, all bets are off, you're just like guys. As a matter of fact, some women start looking like guys. Real beards. <laughs> They lose that. Their waist gets very similar to, to a man's waist. Anyway, uh, that's one of the reasons. What's the other reason? <clears throat> Estrogen protects women. What's the other reason? You do more housework than men do. You chase after the kids more frequently than men do. And you get more, so you get more exercise. It doesn't seem all that fair, but that's the way it works. While cholesterol is partially controlled by heredity, diet and lifestyle plays a major role in the amount of cholesterol in the individual's system. The good news is that more and more people are getting their cholesterol checked, and with maintenance, uh, the levels are declining. And the reason they're declining is because they're starting to treat everybody with statins. We're going to find out that some people don't handle statins very well, and, and it may be doing damage to people. But, until then, of course, we'll just keep feeding everybody statins. High cholesterol levels have been implicated in one-third of all the cancer deaths in the United States. Saturated fats found in red meats and other animal products have been found to be the culprit in breast cancer, in prostate cancer, and in colorectal cancer. So the more fats you eat, the more pro probable the prob probably probable that you'll have colorectal cancer. Now these have to do with your sexual parts. Breast cancer and prostate cancer have to do with have to do with sex. So the more fat you eat, the more likely that you're going to have one of these problems. <clears throat> Breast cancer or prostate cancer. Fruits and vegetables uh, help fight cancers by providing uh, vitamin A. Uh, another name for vitamin A is beta carotene, uh, which helps maintain the immune system to prevent cancerous growth. Uh, selenium can also help, but only if the individual has a selenium deficiency. If you eat a normal diet, then you get enough selenium, you don't have to worry about it. But, of course, you can, if you're on some kind of a strange diet that is selenium poor, 
then potentially you need to, to consume selenium in order to combat, uh, uh, to combat uh, cancer. Uh, the, one of the other things about selenium is that uh, if, you're, if you uh, have a deficiency of selenium, uh, you'll have a lot of colds. So and there's a very relatively small percentage of the population that uh, have this problem, but of course, if you go to the health food stores, they're always trying to sell you selenium so that you won't get catch colds. The reality is that most of us don't have to worry about it. Once upon a time in the United States, uh, when they first started coming out with um, uh, cold remedies, uh, they put uh, pseudoephedrine in all of the cold remedies. Turns out that only about 13% of the population is sensitive to pseudoephedrine. And it only worked on 13% of the population. But they put it in all the cold capsules. And for that reason, when they discovered that you could make crystal meth out of, out of the cold capsules, uh, they didn't take it out, strangely enough, even though it only works on 30% of the population. So if you've ever taken a cold capsule and the thing didn't work anywhere close to, come close to working, it's possible that it had pseudoephedrine in it and you're not sensitive to it. But the guys that uh, it works on, it really works very, very well. So that 13% of the population, if you're one of those 13%, you're good to go. You can take that stuff. Vitamin C and E also help protect the body from open-ended molecules called free radicals. It's not a bad idea to take vitamin C and vitamin E. Probably you get enough in your diet and you don't have to worry about it. However, during the cold season, people take vitamin C and think that they're really charging themselves uh, to keep from getting colds. However, comma, <laughs> if you take in mega amounts of vitamin C and vitamin E, uh, and you don't need it, what happens to that vitamin C and vitamin E? You urinate it out. If your body doesn't need it, it gets rid of it. Now this is okay as far as vitamin C and vitamin E are concerned, and vitamin A. You don't have to worry about A, C, and E. You'll never get poisoned with vitamin A, C, and E. However, the B vitamins are accumulative. And if you get mega doses of, vitamin, of your B vitamins, it will poison you. And you have to be very, very careful that you don't consume too many B vitamins. But you need enough. If you're feeling kind of uh, uh, in low energy, you can get a vitamin B12 shot, and that will perk you up. Make you feel good. Make you feel like you're on top of the world. It works. It really works. But you're probably getting enough vitamin B12 in your diet, you don't have to worry about it. The most common uh, multiple chronic conditions are hypertension and diabetes, uh, hypertension and heart disease, hypertension and cancer. So high blood pressure causes all these problems, but it goes along with all these problems. Uh, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. It is thought that the increase in the levels of obesity may have something to do with this trend, this idea that we get high blood pressure and then all of a sudden uh, we have a comorbid uh, problem, uh, either diabetes, heart disease, or cancer. Uh, high blood pressure, hypertension doesn't really kill, itself by, kill you by itself. Uh, normally you don't die from having high blood pressure. Normally you die from heart disease or cancer or diabetes. You don't die from the uh, hypertension. <clears throat> Low fat or, or fat free yogurt is higher in calcium than most other dairy products. Uh, yogurt contains protein. This is a superfood, considered a superfood. Uh, yogurt contains protein, potassium, and other nutrients. It is sometimes reinforced with plant stainols and probiotics for a healthy gut. And of course, uh, they tell you to take in. Uh, probiotics, uh, you got to be really careful. You don't want to eat Activia like for every meal. If you do that, you're going to have a lot of really strange bacteria in your gut. You don't want that. Uh, your body maintains a select. We are all biomes. We are all uh, bacteriological structures. Uh, we have all, we have different bacteria in our, in our system. I have a different system than you do. I'm 70 years old and I'm from Indiana. I live in Iowa. I come down here. Uh, when I go back to Iowa, I will have Arizona bacteria. 
that I need down here, but I don't need up there. So potentially this is one of the things I will have to reconvert my biome at that point. Uh, but uh, we are all different bacterial structures. We all have different things in our stomachs, uh, in our guts, and we need these. We need all these bacteria uh, to maintain a healthy life uh, for us. Um, it, it all depends on what we eat. So if you guys eat mutton, I sure as hell don't eat mutton. Uh, if you guys eat mutton, then potentially you have different bacteria in your gut. And one, one of the reasons I may not eat mutton is because I don't have that bacteria in my stomach. So when I eat it, I, don't, I feel kind of queasy. Actually, I don't eat it because of, of the smell. But uh, if I ate it, uh, I would potentially feel queasy. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why when you go, I don't know, to Phoenix and you start eating their food, uh, you go, well, I don't feel very good. That, was, that, was there something in that food? Did they put some spice in that food? Well, potentially there is a different spice. Or potentially the bacteria act differently uh, when you eat a hamburger in an in and out burger in, in Phoenix than uh, if you eat an in and out burger in California. It has different bacterial properties. There, there's bacteria everywhere, but potentially that's one of the reasons why every time I go to Albuquerque I get sick. Well, for one thing, I'm coming out of the mountains and going to Albuquerque. Albuquerque is only about 5,000 feet, but, and I'm at 7,500 feet here, so that may be one of the reasons. But the other reason is maybe they put some other crazy stuff in their food. I can't stomach green chilies. Laguna, those guys want to put green chilies on all my hamburgers. My God, I tell them, don't do it. It's greasy it up the way it is. I don't need that. The green chilies to give me a belly ache. Thank you very much. Uh, so you need to think about these things. I mean, if we're traveling across the country, if you eat at Wendy's, uh, it's, Wendy's is the same damn food all the way across, but sometimes they don't cook it the same. Sometimes it's in, in an older grease or a different type of grease. So you guys have different bacteria in your We all have different bacteria in our system could have to do with genetics, it could have to do with what you consume. If you eat jerky, <clears throat> jerky has different bacteria in it. Uh, if you eat uh, corn dogs with uh, mustard, isn't the, did you have mustard on your corn dog? What was that you were putting on your corn dog? You weren't putting, oh, you put ketchup on your corn dog. Uh, anyway, if you eat corn dogs, you get it from the gas station, who the hell knows what, how old that grease is? Anyway, so we need all this stuff to uh, keep a healthy gut. Uh, another superfood are eggs. Uh, eggs are nutritious, economical, and a good way to, to add protein to your diet. I had an omelet yesterday made out of two eggs. I was really proud of myself for eating a superfood. Uh, eggs contain 12 vitamins and minerals, including uh, choline, which aids the brain in development and cognitive functioning. So eggs are a superfood. So if we eat eggs with yogurt, there you go. They, you've eaten two superfoods in the, set, at the same setting. Put nuts in your, uh, in your uh, omelet. There you go. Nuts are a superfood. Uh, they, are, they are a good source of protein. They have heart-healthy fats in them. It's a good source of fiber. And there are antioxidants in there. There's vitamin E in there, which is a good thing. In small doses, nuts can help lower cholesterol and promote weight loss. Uh, so this is one of the things that my wife is doing. She's eating a lot of nuts, which is OK. I just read something else that said not to eat these things. Don't eat peanuts. Don't eat cash, especially cashews because they have uh, renin in them to poison, it, which is a poison, it's a toxin, and the reason it has renin is so that birds won't eat it. But we won't go into that. Kiwi is another superfood. <laughs> Does anybody eat kiwi? I got, I got one kiwi eater, two, two kiwi eaters. Kind of hard to find. You can get them in Walmart and uh, in uh, Gallop. Uh, they burned my tongue. I ate, uh, I, I came home with some, you can't find dill potato chips here. What's wrong with you guys? Nobody eats dill potato chips. 
but up north, it's everybody eats dill. I mean, the green bag of Lay's potato chips is not lime, it's, it's dill. But, but it, I, my tongue's burning out. Yeah. It's still sore, right? And I just finished off the dill potato chips, I don't know, two nights ago or something. Anyway, why am I talking about that? I'm supposed to be talking about kiwis. Uh, the kiwi, uh, so there's only two of you that eat kiwis? Is that right? They're kind of expensive, but they're also good. Aren't they good? Okay. There you go. Pineapple burns my tongue too. So does kiwis burn my tongue and so do pineapple. I, maybe I'm just a wimp. Uh, the kiwi is one of the most nutritionally dense foods. Uh, one large kiwi contains a full day's supply of vitamin C and is also a good source for potassium, fiber, vitamin A, and vitamin E. So, wow, these things like, uh, you, you eat one and you're like uh, taking care of all your vitamins for the day. You might as well not eat anything else, just eat the kiwi. But like I said, it burns my tongue. Another superfood is uh, quinoa. Quinoa is one of the healthiest grains on the planet. One cup of quinoa is high in protein, fiber, zinc, iron, vitamin E, and selenium. There we go, we get our selenium. Uh, it can help control weight and lower your risk of diabetes and heart disease. Uh, quinoa, do you know, does anybody know where this stuff comes from? If this stuff has exploded. Uh, quinoa is grown in Peru. Uh, the Inca had, uh, ate quinoa. And uh, the Spanish would burn their quinoa fields because the Spanish are stupid for one thing. But uh, they also weren't used to this grain. They, they ate wheat. Uh, they didn't eat corn because corn is from the Americas. But quinoa is from the Americas as well. And the, uh, the natives, the Quichua, the, the people that live up in the mountains that were able to stay away from the Spanish or were able to grow their own food, we're still growing this stuff. And then they discovered that it was so healthy, and now there's quinoa fields all over, all over uh, Peru, which is kind of cool if you think about it. But uh, it t tastes kind of nutty. Uh, it doesn't have much of a flavor. It's kind of like rice. You know, you, what do you do with rice? What do you put on rice? Gravy, I guess. <laughs> but quinoa is the same way. It doesn't have much of a flavor. Anyway, cooks up really nice. If you like it, you got to put something on it. You can't just eat it raw, I guess. I don't know. I can't anyway. I, I don't like to eat rice that way either. Uh, when I was in when I was in grade school, it cooks like brown rice. Yeah, 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 brown rice. It's a good one. It's good stuff. Try it. Your kids will hate it because it doesn't have a flavor. It's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Put some sugar in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know that. I was going to say like garlic and herbs, but not sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't guess sugar. When I was a kid, we used to eat rice with uh, cinnamon. That's what they gave us when I was in this elementary school. I used um, what? Oh, okay. It's almost supper. My mother used to do that. She called it uh, goulash. Yeah, my mother used to call it goulash. It's like a goulash. We're, we're not Hungarian, so our goulash had no flavor. <laughs> My mother would make chili with, uh, with tomato juice and uh, kidney beans <coughs> and, with, with, and onions, and that was it. It had no chili sauce it cooked at all. It didn't taste like, it tasted like tomato soup and hamburger and, onions, and beans, or kidney beans. Of course, kidney beans don't cook up very well, so mm -hmm. they're still pretty good. <coughs> but well, I put pinto beans in my chili. I had chili last night for some, and lots of tomatoes and lots of flavor. Uh-oh, here we go with beans. Another superfood are beans. Uh, they are full of uh, insoluble fiber, which uh, lowers cholesterol, and soluble fiber, which makes you feel full and cleans out your colon. This is why you fart so much when you eat beans. It's cleaning out your colon, and that's a good thing. Your colon needs to be cleaned out. 
Uh, remember the colorectal cancer we were talking about before. Uh, the way to keep your colon clean is by having bowel movements or having or cleaning it out with gas with the methane that is created from uh, the foods that you eat. The reason you have gas is because it's methane. Hopefully it's not hydrogen. Uh, if it's hydrogen gas, you've got another problem, but we won't go into that problem. Uh, if you, it's methane. It's just methane, just like all animals will create methane. Uh, they were talking about this last night on 60 Minutes. Uh, the permafrost is melting up in Siberia. And because of that, all that animal and vegetable matter is creating methane. It's creating ga gas house, uh, what is it? climate change. It's too hot. It's creating a really serious problem. All this methane is coming out of the ground. The number one cause of methane in, in the world is cows, as it turns out. They fart a lot. Uh, they pile up their manure, and the manure, of course, just emits all this methane, and it's destroying the ozone layer. So cows are a big problem. Uh, the uh, the uh, Democrats have come up with a green plan. Uh, one of their one part of their plan is to reduce uh, gas out the gas house. What am I talking about? Greenhouse <laughs> emissions. By reducing the uh, fossil fuels that we use, uh, by reducing the coal that we burn, we're not theoretically we're not going to burn coal anymore, and reducing the amount of cows that we are consuming. So I don't know. I don't know. Are we going to? I don't know how we're going to do this. Maybe we're going to put them, or we're going to start raising them in buildings where we can capture the, the methane or something. I don't know. Haven't figured it out yet. Anyway, so that's where all this stuff comes from. Uh, every time you fart, I'm sorry, you are flatulent, uh, you're producing methane, theoretically. If you have a problem in your gut uh, and you're producing hydrogen gas, now we got a really, a, a little bit more serious problem because hydrogen gas doesn't float. Methane, methane kind, no, methane sinks. Uh, but hydrogen gas will stay in your, in your colon, and it'll blow up your colon. It's not, not blow it up, of course, but it will stay in your colon, and it, it gives, you, uh, gives you a different type of gas. So if you've got hydrogen gas instead of methane gas, you've got a real, you probably have ulcers. There's something going on in your, with your stomach acid. Uh, and this is one of the ways we can tell if somebody has uh, ulcers, right? if, they're, if their stomach... Uh, their acids in their stomach are creating ulcers. We can uh, we can t t test their fart, find out if it's hydrogen gas or methane gas. You think I'm kidding? Uh, we used to do this with. Uh, of course, it's in their stomach too. So uh, we used to have a test where we would. Uh, uh, how can I explain this? We would have we wouldn't have them burp. But we would have them breathe into a, a bag, and uh, if it was hydrogen, it would turn an indicator blue instead of, if it was methane, of course, they had no problem. Back, back here? No, 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 it's in, it's in your mouth. I mean, so it, started, it starts in your stomach, and that's where your ulcers are. So we would have them breathe into this bag. Yeah. They would empty their lungs, so it's coming out of their stomach, too. And they blow into this bag, and if it turned blue, it meant that they had hydrogen. They were producing hydro hydrogen gas, which is a problem, which can be a problem. Anyway, you don't want hydrogen gas in your in your colon because it, it's hard to get it out. I mean, sour stomach is that the same as that being hydrogen? Or? Uh, probably not. I mean, if it's perpetual sour stomach, it could be. That's what it could be. I mean, that's why we take prilosec. Zertac and all those other texts. I want to ask Travis something. Now, is there like a remedy for that topic? Or sour stomach? Native herbs? There you go. Uh, they call it East Coal. Okay. And what that does is it cleans you out. It's just a, this way and that. This way. It's herbs that clean you out. Okay. So, do so we know what herbs those are? Is that what you mean? Eat coal? 
He's called it's um where the lightning struck the tree. So that whole place kind of got blue, that bluish color affected that whole. So they get all the herbs around it and chop it up. Small and then they boil that. How often do you find trees that got struck by the there's, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a few. So all right. I was just worried <laughs> that you're gonna run out. <laughs> Yeah, if you say it's there, it's there. <laughs> and then there's uh, roots, uh, certain herbs. Okay. Um, but they use the roots of that herb. That one's a lot stronger. Okay. So you take it. You gotta have a bowl of soup ready. Oh, you throw up right away. After, after, you're gonna have this um, throw up contest in the morning. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna happen in the morning, so you go through a sweat lodge ceremony. And you drink that herb, and then boom, both ways. When I when I was in the military, <laughs> and guys had been out drinking that night, they would have throw up contests the next morning. That was not fun, because I never drank, so I was the one that cleaned it up. Damn it! So uh, is it safe to take that medicine even if you're not feeling good? Or, just, um, or is it more for someone else? It's, you can use it, yeah. Like, even if you're sick, it, it'll help get rid of it. Get rid of all this. Yeah. Stuff. It would be good for a cleanse. A cleanse, yeah. There's um, that bio, that yellow stuff, it gets rid of that really good. Yeah. It's like, oh, strong, strong. <clears throat> and um, do they sell it even, or do you get it from a medicine? Um, you get it from a herbalist. There's one that lives right here by... Uh, one of the stories, she lives on the left side. There's a big pile of wood. She lives in that trailer. It's a light blue trailer and a white, it's light blue. Her name is Dorothy Edison. She's an herbalist. So she makes those. I make it too. I don't want to throw it. But I make it really <laughs> strong. You're going to fill it for three days. Three days? <laughs> That's a weekend. Yeah, that's a long weekend. <laughs> yeah, a long weekend, exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, being so in the military, <laughs> watching all those guys <clears throat> have, a, have a good time. Um, so we're, we're talking about beans. Low fat, protein, carbohydrates, magnesium, and potassium are in the beans. Uh, another superfood is salmon. It's rich in omega-3 fatty acids. It's got lots of protein in it, lots of iron. Uh, there are select tribes that live on the west side of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and uh, that's where the salmon used to spawn, uh, in their rivers. And these guys are very, very healthy, mainly because they eat a lot of salmon. Uh, the, uh, these are the river tribes. Uh, what's uh, Nez Perce, uh, Salish Kootenai, Salish and Kootenai. Uh, Warm Springs? Warm Springs? Uh, yeah, yeah, those guys are, are river traps. Yeah, all these guys eat a lot of salmon. Salmon and eggs. Yeah. Smoked salmon. I know. Yeah. We had, uh, we had a Nez Perce guy at uh, Fort Belknap. We used to bring, uh, you know, two, three hundred pounds of salmon. Whenever he went home, he'd go, he'd bring back a lot of salmon. Anyway, nice guy. Really nice guy. I can't eat fish. <clears throat> uh, for meat, it is low in saturated fats. The American Heart Association suggests that people eat heart-healthy salmon at least twice a week. So if you're a salmon eater, and of course they make fun of these guys, like the, the buffalo hunters do. They make fun of the, the other guys on the other side of the mountain. Everybody makes fun of them. It's a, anyway, they call them fish gut eaters. <laughs> It's interesting to listen to these people arguing back and forth. I told you the story about the, the moose. If, you're, if you live on the plains, if you're a buffalo hunter, you, you, if you're moose, it means you're very strong. If you say you're moose on the other side of the, the with the fish eaters, they, they think you smell like a moose. So these guys would be yelling back, calling each other moose back and forth. And one side, would it would be an insult. The other would be a compliment, as stupid as that is. Okay. Another superfood is broccoli. It's one of the cruciferous uh, vegetables, along with kale, 
uh, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, and radishes. Uh, those are all cruciferous vegetables. Uh, these vegetables are high in, in vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin K, which uh, makes your blood clot, as curious as that is. And of course, there's lots of fiber in those foods. Another superfood is sweet potatoes. They are part of the dark orange vegetable family, which are orange because of their high beta carotene uh, content. Of course, carrots are another, uh, another orange uh, vegetable. Uh, they're high in vitamin A, they're rich in potassium, which reduces bone loss. Uh, they're low in sodium, which lowers blood pressure. And uh, my wife has uh, thin bones, and one of the reasons she does is because she doesn't like carrots. She'll eat raw carrots, but she won't eat cooked carrots, which is kind of silly. Uh, but she has weak bones, and that's one of the reasons why. So to get the full effect of these, all these nutrients, they have to be eaten raw? No. They can be cooked? Yeah. Oil, fried. Fried. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and bacon grease. Fried and bacon grease. <laughs> sure, you can, you can fry them if you want. <laughs> That, you, that you, cabbage diet works just like um, the throat medicine. <laughs> cleans you out really good. Just cleans you right out, okay. <laughs> well, maybe it would work on you that way, but if I, I used to eat cabbage all the time. I mean, almost for every meal. And it's not like I was squirting all day. Because I was used to eating that much cabbage. I, we usually eat in the summertime We'll eat uh, cauliflower for one meal and broccoli for the next, and Brussels sprouts and cabbage. I mean, we'll eat it for practically every meal, and it doesn't clean us out that way. It's probably because, you know, we're different. We're just different. We have different biomes. I tried that diet for a whole week, and it's gave you diarrhea. <laughs> yeah, like cabbage soup. They boil it. Sure. So you eat it um, lunch and dinner. And then you have, uh, you drink, I think it's grapefruit, no, there's another drink that you drink with it. Grapefruit juice, juice will work. Grapefruit, uh, there's another Gee, one. Christmas. What a horrible diet. So it cleans you cleans up. Cleans you right up. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's got a lot of fiber. You, you get tired of that soup. Well, of course you do. Seventh day, you're like, you don't even want to touch it. <laughs> I'll just not eat anything today. Another superfoods are berries. They're high in water and fiber and low in calories. They help you feel full. They control your blood sugar. Uh, berries are full of uh, phytonutrients and antioxidants. Uh, they satisfy your sweet tooth with a fraction of the calories and the fats. Uh, so berries. Uh, berries don't grow as much around here, uh, but uh, up on my property up in Iowa, we have lots and lots of raspberries. Uh, we have a strawberry patch. Uh, so we, we eat berries, cherry trees, we have cherry trees up there. Uh, so we, we eat uh, berries all summer long, which is kind of kind of cool. I've got a cherry pie in my uh, refrigerator right now, left over from last year. I think I ate a lot of these foods when I went through cancer. It's, a lot of these foods helped out with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they would. Yeah. Except the berries. And strawberries. They told me not to eat it because of oh. the pimples that they yeah. 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 So they told me not to eat it because yeah. of bacteria grows right. inside. <clears throat> so Which is interesting. True. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Weight control has uh, four controlling factors: uh, heredity. Uh, some people have a higher metabolic rate, which changes the amount of food that they can consume. Uh, younger and more active in individuals have a higher metabolic rate. Uh, fat has a lower metabolic rate than, uh, than muscle. Uh, men have a 10 to 20 percent more muscle than women do, and for this reason it's easier for men to lose weight than women. And of course, and that irritates women to no end. Certainly irritated my wife. Uh, when she was trying to maintain weight because the Air Force wanted her to be tall and slender. Well, she was short and not slender, uh, so she had a hard time maintaining herself while she was in the military. She was in for 24 years. Uh, she was lucky that uh, they didn't uh, kick her out a couple times. As you can see, this lady went from having a 40-inch waist to a 28-inch waist. Her hips were 53 inches before 
and after she dieted, she was 38 inches. And you can see that's a, a real positive. Uh, the human body is a well-balanced instrument that takes in and burns calories uh, within 1% of its need every year. Uh, so if you eat right, uh, you should be able to not even worry about uh, your body weight. Uh, I have worn the same size pants since 1999. That's 20 years. Uh, I've worn uh, a 33 inch waist pants uh, with 30 inch inseam. That's important. But uh, because of this, uh, whether we exercise or watch our diet or not, we tend to fluctuate around a certain weight, and this is our weight set point. My weight set, set point is between 175 and 185. Uh, this is uh, Rogan, what's his first name? Seth Rogan, I guess is his first name. Anyway, you can see that uh, this is him after dieting. This is him before he dieted, uh, and his weight set point is probably, probably, probably not that much uh, more slender here than he was there. He didn't lose like 50 pounds. He lost somewhere in the 20 pound range, and it made him look a lot s more slender. And we all have this. We all have our weight set points. Studies where normal weighted people ate an excess of calories a day showed that their bodies tried to maintain its, uh, uh, its set point by increased in incidental physical activity. And for that reason, uh, we maintain about the same weight all the time, whether we're dieting or whether we're exercising excessively. Um, I, I ran four times this weekend. Uh, I lifted weights on Friday. Um, I weigh today the same amount that I weighed last week. I ran four times, lost all that water uh, when I was running, I was exercising, my muscles are stronger, but I weigh exactly the same amount that I did last week, which is the same, exactly the same amount I weighed the week before. And I, as I told you, I've had the same, worn the same pants since 1999, which will answer the question, why are your clothes out of style? <laughs> it's because I don't get any bigger. <clears throat> uh, studies where overweight people uh, cut their calorie intake drastically showed that their bodies maintained their weight set point by slowing down metabolism. Uh, so, and this is one of the problems with dieting. If you diet, uh, your body will just slow itself down so that you won't lose weight. Your body wants to be a certain weight, and it will be there. Uh, unless you do something drastic to make it lose weight. Uh, the, different, the difference between, this is Galifianakis, is that what his name is? I can't remember his first name. Is. It's a guy in uh, Hangover. Is that, the, is that the name of that stupid movie? Yeah. Uh, in a study from World War II, a researcher from Minnesota experimented with calorie levels uh, with volunteers to discover what would happen uh, to Europeans if the war drug on. Of course, they were starving to death. The people were starving in Holland. The English weren't getting enough uh, calories. Uh, they had all of these, uh, these uh, uh, individuals that objected to violence, uh, the Quakers, for example. These people volunteered for this study, and they would have them exercise. They would have them consume a select amount of, uh, of uh, calories, uh, they went from 3,500 3, calories to 1,570 calories a day. They dropped from 157 to 115 pounds in six months just because they weren't consuming enough calories. Uh, their heart rates dropped from 55 beats per minute to 35 beats per minute. Uh, their bowel movements decreased to once per week. If you're not consuming that many calories, you don't need to defecate as frequently. So they went down from 157 pounds to 100, 157 pounds to 115 pounds. This is an average, of course. Researchers have discovered that hunger comes from the lateral area of the hypothalamus. As an individual's blood sugar level drops, uh, the lateral hypothalamus will secrete more and more of the hunger-triggering hormone, orexin. Uh, satiety is triggered in the ventromedial uh, nucleus of the hypothalamus. So how do we know when we're full? How do we know? Well, our brain tells us that we're full, but it takes about 30 minutes for that information to get uh, down to our mouths so we stop eating. Fat is stored in the body in, in uh, storage cells called adipo adipocytes. 
adipose tissue, adipocytes. Uh, the normal weighted person will maintain about 30 billion adipocytes. Uh, an obese person may have as many as 200 billion adipocytes. So as you can see, if you are obese, you maintain more of these things than if you're a normal weighted individual. Adipocytes will trigger hunger. The more, the stronger the feeling of hunger, of course. So these are individuals that are feeling hungry. Insulin is produced in the pancreas uh, when glucose levels fall. We produce insulin, which makes us feel hungry. So it's the insulin that tells us it's time to eat. When we consume food, uh, glucose levels rise and we produce less insulin and feel less hungry because we have consumed something. Uh, the intestine also releases cho cholecystokinin, which signals satiety. Uh, it is cholecystokinin that has been blamed for people's sweet tooth. Uh, so I don't know if you've ever been around somebody with a sweet tooth. My dad was, uh, as weird as this sounds, uh, there were two branches of the Bradway family. Uh, one branch of the Brad Bradway family were candy makers. And uh, it wasn't my branch, it was the other branch, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but the Bradways do seem to have a sweet tooth, and my dad was a big candy eater. And one of the reasons he was such a big candy eater is because when he was in Europe during World War II, yeah, they, they fed him chocolate bars. They, 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 you've got chocolate bars in your, in your C and K rations. Uh, so my dad ate a lot of chocolate while he was overseas. Didn't do his teeth any good, but uh, he had a sweet tooth all of his life. Uh, so he'd buy, you know, candy, which he, he maintained uh, into his 90s, as weird as that sounds. So if you went to visit my parents, uh, my dad would have chocolate candy and he would have M&M's. He liked, he liked peanut M&M's, one of his favorite foods. But he had a, this really crazy sweet food. And it's because of what happened to him, to him during World War II. Uh, two other appetite-inducing hormones are ghrelin and peptide Y. I'm sorry, peptide YY. Uh, ghrelin is secreted uh, by the stomach, which induces the pituitary gland to release growth hormone, which stimulates your appetite. Peptide YY is an appetite suppressant. And of course, ghrelin comes from your gut. <coughs> Overweight women are more likely to be depressed and suicidal than women of a normal weight. Oddly underweight men are more likely to be, be depressed and suicidal than men of a normal weight. As weird as all this sounds. So women when they're obese, they are more likely to be suicidal. And they're more likely to be depressed. So how in the world do women fight depression? They eat more. And what do they eat? They eat fat, makes them feel better. Fat has, uh, has uh, tryptophan. Tryptophan is a precursor for uh, serotonin. So the more fat you eat, the better you feel. This is one of the reasons why, uh, despite the fact that it's a stereotype, uh, when women get depressed, they eat ice cream. It's a stereotype, but it's re it's it's real. They really do consume uh, ice cream. And they also con consume chocolate. Uh, milk chocolate, of course, has lots of fat in it, uh, but it also has chemicals in it that uh, make them feel like they're in love. So it makes them feel better. So chocolate is one of the things that you can eat if you're female. It doesn't work on males. But if you're a female, you can eat chocolate. It'll make you feel better. Is that, well, that wasn't chocolate, was it? No. <laughs> uh, or you can consume other fats. Uh, ice cream is good. Males, on the other hand, that's not a real, that's, this is actually a mannequin, it's not a real person. Uh, I, I just noticed. <laughs> those, are, those are his creases for his arm, they've attached his arm. Anyway, uh, males when they are uh, uh, underweight, they are more depressed and more suicidal. Uh, the most frequent means of measuring obesity is body mass index. Body mass index Index is calculated by multiplying your weight in pounds by, seven, by 705 and dividing it by your height in inches and then again by your height, so you divide by your height twice. As weird as that sounds. Where did they come up with this formula? 
Uh, normal body fat for men is uh, between 18 and 23 percent. Uh, normal body fat for women is between 25 and 30 percent. Uh, if a woman doesn't maintain at least 10 percent body fat, she will not ovulate. And if she doesn't ovulate, she won't menstruate. If she doesn't menstruate, she can't have baby. Well, she can't. She doesn't ovulate. She's not going to be able to have babies. Anyway, so this is what a woman looks like when she uh, doesn't have an, enough body fat on her body. Between uh, 10 to 12 percent, this is 15 to 17 percent, this is 20 to 22 percent. Uh, one of the things that women have to do in order to look like they've got a six pack is to reduce themselves almost to the point where they, they're, they're not ovulating anymore. This is what they look like at 25 percent, 30 percent, 35 percent. As you can see, they still look fairly healthy uh, up until they uh, start to uh, get to the 40% range. At that point, of course, they're maintaining a little bit too much body fat uh, in order uh, to look healthy. Weightlifters and other athletes tend to maintain excess of uh, muscle mass and little body fat, but maintain a BMI in the 25 to 30 range. Uh, we had this problem when I was in the service. Uh, one of my jobs, uh, was running the uh, overweight program. Uh, so what we would have to do, we would have to measure their necks, we'd have to measure their body fat on their backs and on their, uh, uh, on their hips, yeah, right, right here. You, order, you also measure the body fat on their stomachs. If you can pinch an inch, you can pinch anything, then, then, uh, then that's body fat. Uh, so we'd have to do this with the weightlifters because these guys were bodybuilders and of course they had big necks, uh, they also didn't have very much body fat. And that way we, of course, could, uh, would not have to kick them out of the service. If you had a BMI that was too high, of course, you, they were supposed to go on the weight control program. It didn't make any sense to put a weightlifter on the weight control program because they were, all they were, would do if they dieted would have uh, create less fat, and of course their muscles would get bigger, <laughs> which didn't work at all. Women, of course, uh, if they had, uh, let's see, how can I say this? Uh, uh, if they were, um, uh, they maintained their fat in, in select areas. Uh, one area that you could, you could carry your body fat in that was acceptable was your chest. Uh, so those individuals, which was kind of, kind of difficult to figure out then. Too much body fat. I mean, if your chest is too large, what does that mean? They're going to kick you out of the service for your excessively large chest. They're mammary glands. This is where you, where women carry their fat. Anyway, uh, that was that was a tough one. That was a tough one. Uh, it doesn't determine uh, whether the fat is, where the fat is being carried. So the BMI just tells you. If you're short in squat, if you're short, not very tall, and you're and you're fairly broad, then you're going to maintain. Uh, you could potentially have no body fat at all, but you would have a high BMI, and that's the problem. The BMI is for tall, slender people. It fits for Northern Europeans. Doesn't fit for Hispanics. Hispanics tend to be short and, and relatively squat. I have a problem because my people were coal miners. In, in Europe. Uh, because we were coal miners, we're not very tall. We tend not to be very tall. But we also tend to be relatively broad. So we're kind of SOL as well. We're not tall and slender like Northern Europeans, like the damn Vikings. Okay. It doesn't determine where, the, where, the fat, where you're carrying your fat, and this is a problem. Uh, body fat in the waist area can be a problem, but fat in other areas should not cause a problem. And for this reason, of course, those individuals should be allowed to uh, should be allowed to uh, be in the service. Another way to measure obesity is by measuring waist to hip ratio. Uh, measure your waist at its slimmest point. Measure your hips at their widest point. Divide your waist by your hip measurement. Anything below 0.8 is normal for a woman. Anything below 0.95 is normal for a man. Uh, men, men, of course, don't have that much of a difference between their hips and their waists. Women do tend to have a more, far more slender waist than they have hips. And for this reason, of course, uh, we can determine if they, have, uh, if they have too much body fat. Hip to waist, weight, waist ratio. 
The incidence of hypertension in people who are 50% or more overweight is three to five times that of normal weight individuals. Oh, 1150, 1150, yeah, okay, we're almost done. One more slide. Uh, the prevalence of metabolic syndrome, coronary artery disease, stroke, diabetes, inflammation increases with the increase of BMI. Overweight men are six times as likely to develop metabolic syndrome. Obese men are 32 times as likely to develop metabolic syndrome. Uh, overweight women are five times as uh, likely to develop metabolic syndrome. Obese women are 17 times as likely to develop metabolic syndrome. For this reason, we have more men with diabetes than we have women with diabetes. Because it's far, if, if a man is obese, it uh, is mo far more likely that, that that individual will develop diabetes. Why don't we stop right here, pick this up next time, talking about medical.